I'm Evan Snyderman, and uh, I'm the son of Rick and Ruth Snyderman. I have put together an exhibition on the 50th anniversary of the Snyderman Works Gallery, which was a project that I felt was something that needed to be done to tell the story of what they have accomplished in the field of the American studio crafts. I'm Rick Snyderman, and Ruth and I have uh, run this gallery, more or less, for 50 years. Ruth started it in 1965. If you look around this room, you're seeing an exhibition that is Evan's eye at work. The setting up of a space in an exhibition is a piece of theater. The way that the set is arranged directs your mind and your emotions as to what's going to happen. Evan came and looked at this space with a completely fresh vision and changed its feeling completely. Do you know what your dad does? What's his job? Yeah, he works in a store and he works with other people's artwork. He puts it in the store and then he has a show, but sometimes he makes stuff and he shows that. He did that a long time ago and now he's doing just other people's work, but he's still doing a little bit of his work. My dad's store is called R and Company and he's the co-boss. He works with a partner that he used to work with in the flea market and now they come up like in a company. He used to be selling 20th century, but he recently started selling a little more modern stuff, mostly furniture. Your dad also was the curator for the show for your grandparents, which means he kind of organized it? Yeah, he came out to Philadelphia on yeah. and then Tuesday he, and he helped set up the show. And then he came back and came again with us. I think your dad is an extremely cool guy. I just met him for the first time a couple days ago, and he did a tremendously great job with this show, I think. And you guys don't mind being on YouTube? No. <laughs> when I first started thinking about how to make a movie about Ruth and Rick Snyderman, I thought it was going to be about art and the history of craft in America. After all, they've represented some of the best craftspeople and artists in the country and added immeasurably to the development of the field. But I soon realized that the real story here is family. Each generation has passed down a legacy that is then embraced and extended. And to be in this family does not require shared blood the artists, collectors, and friends that Rick and Ruth have made along the way are welcomed into an ever-growing circle of people devoted to beautiful objects and their makers. I'm Jane Sauer, and I'm currently doing arts administration, but I was a studio artist for about 25 years. And my very first solo show was at the Schneiderman Gallery, and I was totally thrilled when they invited me. I was one of their loyal artists for many, many years. I came here from St. Louis to celebrate this event. It's why I'm here. So you must have a certain sense of loyalty and love for the Snydermans. I have a sense of loyalty, love, and I have to add admiration because I know this business from several different points of view and I was an artist and then I grew to own my own gallery in Santa Fe, New Mexico and all through that we remain friends and colleagues and I admire them so much for hanging in there and doing this and really being the pioneers in this particular art form of creating objects. I am Richard Kagan. I'm a former furniture maker and current photographer. We go back a long time, and it was really the Snydermans that encouraged me to come to South Street to open up my workshop as a furniture maker and the gallery that I operated for 10 years that represented probably the finest woodworkers in the United States. Then 
I closed my gallery because of back trouble. That's when I became a photographer. Rick Snyderman took over my gallery, and that's how the Snyderman Gallery began. I've always collected tools, not only to do my work, but as sculptural objects. I still have a whole room full of boxes of tools. I really believe that these objects that were designed for use have taken on a life of their own, and they're imbued with their own spiritual energy. Ruth Snyderman showed the first dining table that I made in Philadelphia. She bought the first photograph that I ever sold. She gave me my first photography exhibition. And the Works Gallery and later the Snyderman Gallery have been so important in this country. They were pioneers. They've made an incredible contribution. You are the owner of the piece behind you? I'm not the owner yet. But you hope to be someday? I hope to be, yes. Are you a longtime customer of yes. the Snydermans? Yes, I am. Give me the customer's eye view of the Snydermans. They are lovely people. What they show is fascinating and of a wide range of craft and art. And I've always been amazed with the range of beautiful artifacts that they show. That's really it. And they're just lovely people. In 1996, the Snyderman Gallery and Works Gallery combined and opened joint operations at 303 Cherry Street in Old City, Philadelphia. In their apartment upstairs, Ruth Snyderman gave me the history leading up to this point. I'm Ruth Snyderman. I am the founder of the original Works Gallery. Right in the beginning of opening our gallery was the beginning of people becoming aware of crafts in America. Craft shows started in Vermont and we went to the first craft show at Rhinebeck, Vermont. We would drive up in our old VW bus and go around and pick out what we wanted, put it in the bus and come home. Later, there was another gallery or two in Philadelphia for the same field, and we would all line up, and then there would be a time when the gates would open and we'd all run so we could get the work first, because only one of us could have that work. It was a real race. The crest people would come down and bring work, and they'd stay with us, or we would go to their homes a lot. We many times went up and visited crafts people in Maine and New Hampshire, and then we would stay with them. So it was a whole different period than now when you go to large shows that might have 1,600 artists. It's not that same personal feeling now that it was in the 60s. I always loved to draw and paint, and I did want to go to art school. I wanted to go to Tyler, and we lived a few blocks from Tyler at the time, and my father talked me out of it, and he said, you have to go to Temple and take business, and you can always do art on the side. So I did. I went to Temple University, and while I was there, I met Rick Snyderman, who later became my husband. I went out with him one time, and he never called me again at that point. Years later, I saw him at a concert, right after I moved into Center City, that same week. And his mother had my phone number. She gave it to Rick before he saw me, and he threw it in the trash. And then when he saw me, he went back and got it out of the trash. And we went out and never saw anyone else after that and got married in 1965. I worked in a social agency, and there was a woman that worked with me who was interested in crafts, and she knew more than I did. And she and I opened the Works Gallery together in 1965. It wasn't making any money. And my husband was working in his father's finance business. So we had an income. We were not having to worry about whether we made a fortune in the craft business, which we still haven't made. But anyway, after a year and a half, she got out. So I took it over by myself until 1972 when Rick decided that he wanted to come into the business with me instead of running his father's business. His father retired and had hoped he would take that over, but he decided against it. I think he was uh, rudely shocked when I said, I'm sorry, Dad, 
but this isn't where I see my life going. Hi, I'm the guy who's making this movie. I'm briefly going to interrupt Ruth's history, but while I'm doing so, you're going to get to look at some art. So sit back and relax. Rick's father, Jack Snyderman, was born in the United States, but his parents were from Riga, Latvia. Jack's dad died when Jack was only 15, so he had to drop out and never finish high school. But in the 1930s, Jack started a small loan company that became quite successful. When Rick was a teenager, Jack's company faced regulatory issues that threatened to destroy it. Somehow, Jack managed to adapt and completely reinvent his business. The second company also became successful, and after graduating from Temple University, Rick started working with his dad. But times were a-changing. In the classic fashion, of immigrant families. You're successful, you build your business, your kids are your beneficiaries of that business and that's one of the reasons you're doing it. And that's the way the normal system operates and so he was um, completely perplexed. Ruth and Rick often hosted artists in their home and Rick recalls a sight he saw one morning as he was leaving the house to work at his dad's finance company. There was Patrick Murphy, who was a flute maker, and one of the other people, and they were standing on their heads in a perfect yoga repose. And I ran by them out the door to go to work, and as I got about halfway down the block, I said, one of us is wrong. <laughs> I should think about this aha moment. <laughs> there were other ways, other choices that you could make, and they were perfectly valid choices, and you just had to understand how they operated. In the way that I could never explain to him, I was saying, Dad, I'm actually following your model. To take the risk of jumping off the edge, you have to step away from the usual way of doing things. You both made a decision to go into art and leave what in your case was social work and in your case was the finance business. So that was a pretty risky thing to do. If you make a decision based on your own self-confidence, then anything that you do is the challenge and the fun of it, the adventure of it. I always think of it as an adventure. Figuring out how it's going to happen, it goes along because you've invented solutions, and then you have to figure out what happens next. So the fun of living your life is not knowing what the final answer is, but solving the problems as the life goes along. So that's what makes life interesting for me. Every week there's some challenge, and somehow we get over it and get through it and go on to the next part of right. our lives, right. which will never be as easy as having a paycheck every week that you know about. But it's been a richer life than we could have ever had in our other fields. I never looked back at any time that I ever looked back. Did your dad ever get to appreciate the decision that you made? Uh, there was an early story about us in the business section of the paper, as uh, that this was a business venture and somehow that made it okay with my father. <laughs> All right. What can I say? I'm a sucker for father-son rapprochements. Now back to Ruth's history of the early days of Snyderman Works. When we opened the gallery, it was six months after we got married. We started with ethnographic art. We had all the crafts that come from Poland, crafts from Morocco, and we had Peruvian as well as having 10 potters from the Wallingford Potters Guild, jewelers. Later on, we started to carry Eskimo sculptures as well. We had glass in 1969, I believe, was the first glass artist that came to Philadelphia, Roland Jahn. He came from Germany, he set up the furnaces at the University of the Arts, which was Philadelphia College of Art at the time. He had his first exhibit with us. In 1970, we opened a second location on South Street in the 300 block. We kept the Locust Street business for two more years, and it really wasn't growing that much, and so we just put our minds on the South Street business. At that time, most of the buildings were boarded up in that neighborhood, 
but there were a lot of creative people that lived around there. The Theater of the Living Arts was across the street. People that did the set designs built our gallery on South Street. The costumer decided that she needed a place to live and she took the second floor of the building and we took the first floor. We each paid $67.50 a month rent. Our daughter was born in 1967. Her name is Ami. Hi. You must be the sister. Hi. The daughter. I'm the sister and the daughter. Oh. I'm both. And she was named after a Polish woman who talked Rick into marrying me. She was a psychiatric social worker in New York. Rick was going to go to Europe with a friend, and she spent an hour talking to him, and by the time he came out of that session, he decided he wouldn't go to Europe with a friend, and he would marry me, so we thought we all name our first child Ami. It's a good story. I always have a good story to tell about my name. And then in 1970, our second child, Evan, was born. We ran a market called the Head House Open Air Market. It was a craft market. It started in 1969. Friday nights and Saturdays and Sundays with the Zagars who lived on South Street. When Evan was born, he was in a little carrier under the table there, and Ami grew up going to all of those weekend events. Julia and Isaiah and the two of us had five food booths plus our craft booths. It got South Street started really because a lot of people then started to walk on the street after going to the head house market and it was all Philadelphia craftsmen who were in it. And then in 1983, Rick opened a separate gallery next to the works on South Street, just for furniture and glass. I'm Julia Zagar. Ruth said you're her best friend. Yes, we are best friends because we go to Weight Watchers together uh -oh. every week and then go out to eat. Well, neither of you really need to do that, do you? Not anymore, we're fine. <laughs> I saw you in a bathtub upstairs. That's right. I also clean myself. Oh. <laughs> Occasions like this, I tend to drink a lot. Oh, that's good. That's good. My name is Isaiah Zagar. I am a Philadelphia artist. I've lived here for the last 49 years. 48 of those years I've known Rick and Ruth Snyderman. My wife and I have a folk art gallery called the Eyes Gallery at 4th and South. South Street in 1968 when we moved in was a derelict non-functioning street. It was a street of failure. It was going to be made into an expressway. We chose the street out of sheer misery in what had become a six-month terrible odyssey in Philadelphia where I had a nervous breakdown and we became pregnant and we just didn't know what to do. Moving to South Street was the key because South Street was down in the dregs where we were. We were artists, but after my nervous breakdown, we didn't know what to do. We scavenged all of the materials that made up our shop and made up our home. I was sitting waiting to greet a man named Rick Snyderman because earlier that day, Ruth Snyderman had come to the gallery with her young daughter, Ami. And Ami was riding a little tricycle and proceeded to fall into our basement. I gathered her up and she wasn't really wounded, just a few little scrapes. And that began our friendship because Ruth was there on a mission to find out how much we were selling our Peruvian rugs for. She's always been an amazing businesswoman, but more than a businesswoman, she has been a glorious human being and friend for us over these many years. It crystallized in her that she needed Rick to meet us because this was some people that she wanted to know and get to know better. And when Rick came, he said, you two people have a destiny with us. Why don't you come to dinner? And so we did. And we've been having dinners ever since. It belongs to my uh, concept of food as art. 
There are all sorts of wonderful legends about apples. Hippolytes, who was the guardian of the apple of immortality that was necessary for the gods to have. Achilles, in order for him to get the apple, he had to hold up the world. <laughs> it's a very complex legend. There's also a snake in there, which makes you think of the Garden of Eden a little bit. Right. It's a combination. Because yeah. all the golden apples legends have a little bit of evilness. Every single one of them had some devious qualities about the, the greed for the golden apple. <laughs> This is Ron Isaacs. He's from Kentucky. Every bit of this is ply with the buttons, the leaves. Oh my God. Isn't that amazing? It is. What do you think of this jewelry? Oh, it's fantastic. Had you ever heard of the artist before? Yes. Who is he? His name is William Scholl. I have two pieces of his. Really? From the way, way, and I said, I wonder if any, these look like William did you see his stuff downstairs? The sculptures is going. We're on our way down. Oh, it's great, great. Well, I'm William Scholl, and I've been showing my work with Rick and Ruth for 40 years. I've been a jeweler for 50 years. In the past 12 so years, I've been turning to sculpture. I'm more excited about my sculpture than the jewelry at this point although I'm still making jewelry, but this is the first time I'm showing my sculpture. People seem to like it, and that's always nice. The jewelry I consider a decorative art, and it leaves room for the customer's input and changing things to their liking. And I did that, and it was very personal, and I got to know a lot of very nice people that way. But I always longed to do fine art where it was my statement and nobody was going to tell me, well, could you change it this way? Could you make it mine? But I couldn't make a living that way. So I started making these stones and it was very much a metaphor for the passage. Life presents a way through a difficulty and if you catch it, you can maybe make some progress with that difficulty. These sculptures of drilling through the stone and gold leafing the whole tunnel and then having an entryway, which was the jeweler in me. I had to fabricate something in metal. That's the metaphor for these passages in life. So it's almost like a self-portrait of a jeweler turning into a sculptor. Well, in a way, yeah, but it goes way beyond that. It goes to life. This exhibition is so filled with beautiful things. It's awe-inspiring. Gary Bennett started his career in the 1960s making roach clips and they sold for three dollars each. Now that he's 80, he doesn't have that strength to make these heavy pieces of furniture. So he's combining wood with roach clips and he has a metal plating company and so he's able to do this beautiful metal work. This adjusts, see, to hold the joint and then to tighten it. He's 80, do you think he still smokes marijuana? Sure. I got interested in glass as a young kid. I had my first opportunity to blow glass when I was 13 years old with an artist named Thurman Statham who I actually included in this exhibition.
in this case are three of what I think are some of the most important glass makers, all for very different reasons, and all these guys are in many different museum collections around the world. Well, this is Harvey Littleton. He's considered the grandfather of American studio glass. Harvey's no longer alive, but he is one of the first American glass sculptors to push it into more of that realm of sculpture as opposed to vessel making. This piece down below and these two are by Tom Patty. Tom Patty was also part of that early glass movement anti-vessel maker or really pushing the boundaries of what traditional glass was supposed to be and he was really like a mad scientist I mean he developed whole new techniques for casting and fusing glass that was really mind-blowing he really opened up a lot of possibilities for people and no one else has ever really been able to duplicate the sort of work that he did Richard Marcus was also incredibly important to the American studio glass movement because he's one of the first, along with Dale Chihuly, to go to Italy in the 60s or early 70s and bring back some of those Italian glass making techniques that had been off limits to the rest of the world for hundreds of years, since the Roman times. When those guys came back from Italy, they learned all these new techniques of cane making and marini making and all these very traditional Venetian techniques that no one knew how to do. And they shared it with the rest of the world. All the contemporary glass makers learned what these guys brought back. They're the basis of this entire young glass movement of, you know, technical glass point that people are obsessed with now. Dale Chihuly really set a particular standard in glass. He was very moved by the Northwestern baskets. He is from Washington State. He loved and he collected uh, native baskets from the Tlingit and other cultures of the Northwest Indians. They became a metaphor for his sculptural glass pieces. So these basket-like forms were unique in the way glass was being worked. And he made a case for making these beautiful pieces that had a very wonderful sensuousness. William Morris was the gaffer for the El Chihuly. Before that, he was down to Chihuly's truck, truck driver. driver. That's correct. Morris became quite well known for pieces that are easily twice the size of this. He became very interested in anthropologic information, the kinds of things that you would see in a cave painting. And then he began to do a series of what he called canoptic jars, which were like reliquary pieces. And that's when he became really quite famous. He's not active as an artist anymore. This is a piece that we commissioned Edward Zucca to make for us at our first gallery, the Works Gallery on Locust Street in 1970. He had just graduated from the University of the Arts. He wanted a display at Tegere, and this is the piece that he created for us. I'm Michael A. Smith. I'm a photographer. Back in 1967, I had my first exhibition at the Works Gallery. I live in Bucks County now. At the time, I was living in Center City, Philadelphia, and I shared a fire escape with Ruth. She lived in the next building over, and we met. At the time of my exhibition, I had been photographing only six months. But the work was very good. That same work was collected within a year by the Art Institute of Chicago and the Philadelphia Museum of Art. They contacted me a few months ago and said they'd like to include me in this exhibition and I feel deeply honored because they're a fantastic resource and gallery and this show is very special. started with Rick and Ruth in uh, 1969. had a number of solo shows here and Rick and Ruth have collected my work. It's always an honor if the dealer actually purchases your work because that's sort of a, a stamp of approval because they must love your work enough in order to have that in their own collection. What do they have of yours? Uh, well, they have the music stand and the ladderback chair. Can you explain what's going on with that? 
okay, that would be from the late 70s, early 80s. I was in Tasmania doing an artist in residency, looking back to America from a opposite side of the world. I started taking a close look at the Shakers, started doing my own interpretation of the Shaker ladder back chair. So that's really what that one's about. Do people ever try to sit in that chair? Uh, don't even go there. <laughs> no, it's, it's a statement about chair as opposed to being an actual functional chair. <laughs> I've always worked with natural tree formations. I studied with Wendell Castle. I was his very first apprentice. He had a strong influence on me. He was stack laminating and I was taking just solid tree sections and carving like this chair here from the early 80s. So. It's really beautiful stuff. Oh, thank you. How about this music stand? This is Wendell Castle. This is his most iconic piece, the music rack, which he first made in 1968. Evan attended Rochester Institute of Technology, where the legendary furniture maker Wendell Castle was teaching. Ruth and Rick's close friendship with craftspeople like Wendell gave Evan a ticket for entry into their world. And so when we would go up to visit Evan, we would always stay with Wendell and Nancy. They would have us for dinner, and Evan, of course, was invited to those dinners. Evan would grow up with that experience. Evan was a fly on the wall, as it were, in that world of artists who were already well-established. In the late 60s, Wendell Castle created furniture out of molded plastic and had a show of it. It was a very unsuccessful exhibition. The work was not well received. And Wendell stored it in his barn, and there it sat for the next 20 years or so. And Evan remembered seeing that furniture, and of course he was of the next generation. He was very intrigued. Evan looked at that stuff of the past and said, no, this is a gleaning of the future. And he created an exhibition in 2004 called Autoplastic, and it was the revival of this series of pieces that Wendell had made in the 1960s. We went to the opening at Evan's gallery, and there were so many people that you couldn't get in the door. Evan's wife is Gabrielle Shelton. She has a studio with five employees in Brooklyn. And she designed and fabricated and installed our staircase for us and also made the chairs for us. Filming can be an exhausting business and I retreated to the office to catch my breath. Evan and Gabrielle's kids, Ellery and Cleo, and Ami's son, Jared, were there, and I innocently asked Cleo if she could make up a song about her grandparents. Post-it notes, she tartly replied. I need post-it notes. And then she began furiously to write. How do enterprises like Snyderman Works and R and Company happen? It truly is a multi-generational effort. This is a family filled with intelligence, passion for the field, boundless curiosity, and the willingness to take risks and share what each has gained individually with the others. They were just always about what was next and what was new, and they did it for the right reasons. They did it because they believed in the artists and because they believed in the work. My first job was working in the basement packing and unpacking boxes when I was 10 years old. So they taught me how to be involved in, I guess, a good work ethic. They've worked almost every day of their lives, and they've never regretted a minute of it, which is pretty cool. And then Cleo announced they were ready. Mom! 